The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to talk about the world of permaculture, as well as DIY self-care techniques and methods. And our guest, we're going to talk about bread with guest, author, Hannah Dela Cruz. And we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And welcome to another edition of the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy you are with us today. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're happy you're tuned in, whether you're listening to us on one of the 17 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2022 through our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, underneath the season six tab at the top of the page, in studio video replay, podcast replay, radio app, however you're doing it. Thank you very much. You want to be part of the program, you can do that by sending us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or if you'd like to give us a call, you can do that on the Proclamation Hotline brought to you by Proclamation Goods. That number, easy to remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. Show 1-800-927-7469. Proclamation Goods creates cookware for the eco-conscious home chef. Their pans are non-toxic, have a lifetime warranty, and are made in Wisconsin. Their award-winning stainless steel Proclamation dual cookware set is a 12-inch skillet. That doubles as a wok. Best of all, a skillet and stock pot hinged together to form a Dutch oven. It's two pans with a versatility of 10, empowering you to cook more with less. If you care about your health and strive for a more sustainable lifestyle, then Proclamation Goods is for you. Supplies limited, so order yours now at proclamationgoods.com. We're going to talk about the world of permaculture, Holly. What is permaculture? For those who are not familiar but have heard the term, but uh, they kind of think maybe it's like a really big, in-depth, I could never do it because it takes a lot of land and all this other stuff. Right. So t- permaculture is the development of agricultural ecosystems or agricultural practices that are intended to be sustainable and possibly self-sufficient. Now, this does not mean that you need a ton of land and or agricultural land, whatever that may be to you. I know like at one point in my life, I probably would have thought that you need a lot of land to do this or um, have some sort of agricultural um, experience. But Right, but there are people who are very permacultural. They use permaculture and they do not have acreages. They have, you know, the equivalent of maybe a city lot. It's very small, but they are very wise in how they utilize the space in which they have. Right. And so there's different types of permaculture. Yeah. Some of these you might even be practicing. I didn't know I was doing that. It. Right. And so I'm a permaculture person. You can just add that to your, you know, put a little notch in your. And put it on your resume. Resume, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll give you the job at the bank because you do permaculture, right? Is that a thing? I don't uh, do, No, There's what do you mean? Is that a thing? Do you get bank jobs because you do permaculture? No, you have to have bank job. You have to have banking bank experience. Should, yeah. Should we tell that story? Go ahead. Okay. So uh, many moons ago, Joey and I were at a job fair looking for jobs and this bank was hiring. And I said, I said, what did I say? What do you need to work here? No, yeah, you told me you need to work here. Well, we were, there was a woman in front of us. Yeah. And the banker said, and the lady said, well, what, what do I need? You know, can I get a job here or whatever? And she goes, do you have any banking experience? And she said, no. And the banker goes, well, you would need banking experience to work here. <laughs> oh, it wasn't me. No, it wasn't no, you. It no, it wasn't me. Mm-hmm. Okay. All this right. This is so long ago. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyway, I think, um, so permaculture, one of my favorite permaculture concepts is Hugel culture. Right. But with, but with permaculture, with gardening, you don't have to have experience. You can learn as you go. Right. Not not like banking. Right. Okay. But you know, you need to get banking experience from somewhere. Right. But not that place. Right. So, so Hugel culture. culture. So this is where basically you are building a little hill and it's typically from rotted wood. 
and rotting rotting wood yeah. and then the rotting wood does this magical thing where basically helps um be a sponge mm -hmm. for moisture and you put the and you hill up the soil over that and that's how you get hookah culture and this hill this could be three foot wide and arched over you know five foot tall 20 foot tall hookah culture can be a vast magnitude or tiny amount of wood in the hill i've seen hookah cultures in a large uh, situation where they brought in large uh, industrial building equipment in order to mound these mounds 30 or 40 foot high and there's about 60 foot wide and they it looks like a mountain but they have got inside that structure is all of these rotting logs that are absorbing and releasing moisture as a kind of like a wicking system right yeah, exactly. And that's what that's what hookah culture is. Another one is vermicomposting. And I I feel that you could put just composting into yeah. this as well. It doesn't have to be vermicomposting. Vermicomposting is when you involve worms to help with the compost process. It just encourages a little bit of a faster process uh -huh. at times. And then you get that the good worm castings, which is the worm poop. Um, you also get worm with well, worm juices or the worm, compost yeah. juice. Uh, that it, two, so you get two in one on that deal, right? But regular composting is don't don't use garden worms. No, 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 no. Yeah, you want to use composting worms, and they, I think people buy them online or yes. whatever. Yeah, why yeah. not? <laughs> get some worms. Yeah, I love worms. So hey, if I got worms shipped to me, no, I'd not be sad. No, no. no? No, no. Vermicompost. And people <laughs> do this inside. You don't want to do it outside if it's like you're in a climate like in the north where it's going to get negative four degrees. You want to do it in a place where the worms won't freeze. Uh, so you want to be aware of how you're doing this. You can do it in a basement, in a climatized garage, that type of thing. Probably not in your bedroom or, or in the kid's room or the living room. Doesn't necessarily smell, but it's a process. Right. Absolutely. Um, so then another one is rainwater harvesting. Okay. Now, that can be uh, like a rain barrel, or that can be a specific uh, area that has been dug out for the purpose of c consuming or gathering water for distribution on crops and or livestock. Right. And so that could be something like a retention pond. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about retention ponds? Well, I, I can talk about the pond that we have on the farm. Okay, that's fine. Uh, many, whenever mom and dad bought the property, they had... They looked at where they had uh, an engineer, somebody came out, and they saw that there's this one level area that the water would come off the fields, and it was just a pasture, just an open area of grass. So they had um, a company come in and dig a well, or not a well, dig the pond out where the pond, where the grass used to be, and then that's where they put the pump in, and they've pump you know trench lines from the pond half mile to a mile all over the farm to or be able to capture the water for animal consumption not so much irrigation because we never irrigated anything but it was all animal consumption cattle hogs that type of thing uh, daily use around the house so you can find out based on the way the land is laying and the way the water naturally um, flows through particular areas, whether or not that would be a good spot for a pond. Now, keep this in mind, Department of Natural Resources, you might want to check with them because they are very unhappy when you start trying to alter certain current natural pathways of water. If you want to uh, block up a, a stream or something or reroute it, they get really unhappy about that kind of stuff. So you want to make sure that you ask all the questions first because in this situation, saying, I'm sorry, I didn't know, doesn't work and that fine doesn't go away that they issue for messing stuff up in the natural resource area. So did your parents get fined? No, no, they, oh. they it was all done right, but I'm just saying oh, there okay. are people that will go, oh, I want a pond here. We'll just reroute the stream to fill the pond up. And that's not, pe if, right. pe if the right people find out, they're not happy. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so rainwater harvesting, that's another thats another one. And then also um, agroforestry. So agroforestry is essentially when you are growing vegetables, herbs, and fruit trees together. So this can be The anything. perfect thing. Right. It's mm -hmm. like a, I don't know, like a utopia, uh -huh. Eden type, yeah. Garden of Eden type thing. Yeah. So you have 
all of these growing together in harmony. You're perhaps, you know, you have a shady area and your fruit trees are shading the shade vegetables. Mm-hmm. And then you have an open area for the, the sun vegetables and and The, the way we all vision, if we were going to buy property, we want 50 fruit trees of 17 different varieties and a field, you know, an acre of uh, asparagus and two acres of, you know, the perfect scenario. A bunch of peach trees. A bunch of peach trees, apple yeah. trees, you know, all these things that you can have in your particular region that had been planted 50 years ago and it's ready for you to move in, which is harder and harder to obtain that type of um, a task to find such a location nowadays because those who have it don't give it up. Right. And then there's also grazing, mm-hmm. which grazing um, livestock will help main- help uh, maintain the ecosystem. So this can be from uh, sheep, goats, uh, cows, etc. Chicken coops chicken, or, uh, and chicken, chicken runs, tractor, yeah, tractor, chicken where runs. you move it every yeah. couple of days and it fertilizes the ground. They eat the worms and the bugs and you move it on a little farther. Yeah. And then also proper land management in that aspect of picking a number. You've got a 10 acre field of grass pasture and you've got X amount of sheep or goats or cows and you've divided that pasture in half so they're not grazing on the whole thing they're stayed in one side of the pasture for a certain duration of time until they've ate it down and then you move them over to the other side to allow that portion in which they've ate down to regrow as they fertilize with you know going to the bathroom and all that and then they're eating the grass that has not been touched so you're utilizing the pasture in a more manageable way half and half, and giving each side proper time to recoup what was taken off of it. Right. So that is um, another... uh, Another level of permaculture. Level of permaculture. And then there's things where you are doing um, suburban or urban permaculture. Which is probably the majority of people who are listening. Right. And that can include like perennial uh, edible plants. That can include some fruit bushes small fruit trees that can include perennial vegetables such as like sunchokes and art are not artichokes or they're called journalism artichokes um asparagus yeah. um and then just working within your own ecosystem where you know that my backyard gets shade here not shade here um i can put this here i can rotate these crops that is or maybe i'm gonna put i grow this better in container so i'm gonna put this on my porch what have you or and that is good and or i don't grow this very well so i'm going to utilize this spot for something i can grow well and i know what i can't grow well i can get locally at the farmer's market or the uh, natural food store type of situation as well don't try to uh, struggle and continue to struggle to grow something that continuously has not a very good success rate when you can put other things in that area, bed, corner of the yard, that has a very high production and success rate that you're good at. And we're not always all going to be good at growing all the things we want. So we need to be honest with ourselves and go, I can't grow this, so I'm going to grow that instead. Even you know, even something like uh, like meat, maybe you think that you, you like organic, organically raised beef and uh-huh. you purchase a cow. I mean, not a whole cow. Quarter cow, half Quarter cow. cow, yeah. Not like an actual cow, well, like not it, a live cow. For those who <laughs> consume meat, you yeah. mean purchase a portion of the meat of butcher, a cow. Butcher, butcher, yeah. yeah. And speaking of meat, yes. Walton's has everything but the meat. Yes, you know, they do. Yeah, they do. Listen, we know where you care about your food comes from. It's canning, preserving, harvest time. Um, pretty soon it's gonna, it is going to be animal harvest time. You can get all the equipment, seasoning, and supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any other meat product your way to your high standards. There's also meatjustics.com to help educate people on the hows and whys of meat processing, as well of, of over 15,000 users to help give their guidance on meat processing issues. Decades of experience in the meat processing industry. They're there to help you so you don't make the mistake that they've made. Absolutely. They have uh, meat grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers, all the spices, all the everything. Everything but meat. Exactly. You can use code GROW50 to save 10% off orders of $50 or more and get free shipping. When we come back, organic methods of self-care. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. 
Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. It's time to get excited for our fall season. Tree Dash Ripe delivers the best Oregon pears, Wisconsin honey crisp apples, and Florida citrus you'll ever eat, directly from the farm within days of being picked. Their pears and apples can be delivered directly to your home, and you can find their citrus at over 200 orange stops throughout the Midwest this winter. All the event details and ordering information can be found on their website, tree-ripe.com. And an extra bonus for you listeners, get apples and pears delivered right to your house with 10% off your purchase by using coupon code H-O-L-L-Y-1-0, HOLLY10. The discount's only available for home delivery. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Are you seeing fruit flies in your kitchen? Fruit flies love a fall harvest. They hitch a ride into your house on the fresh veggies and fruits you are picking. Break the breeding cycle with fruit fly traps from Rescue. Rescue fruit fly traps are reusable and an economical way to keep fruit flies at bay. They're the only trap with a no-spill design. And only the Rescue fruit fly traps are made in the USA. Learn more about them at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-E-U dot C-O-M. Take the guesswork out of composting with hot bin composting. Quickly break down food scraps within 30 to 90 days. Find out more at hotbincomposting.com. Thanks for listening to the Garden with Joe and Holly radio show. As you've heard through the program, many companies offering coupon codes to help you save on great products. If you've missed any of those coupon codes, you can go to our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable gardener.com and click on the money tab at the top of the page and they're all listed for you the gardening with joy and holly radio show is brought to you by the following pro plugger chip drop bell buster johnny appleseed ivy organic milkweed balm waltons incorporated blooming easy plants jung seeds find all sponsors at the wisconsin vegetable gardener.com and thank them for their support Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Tree diaper. It's pretty much done growing for most of us here in uh, the northern portions of the United States. But you've had some problems. We've had problems. Uh, If you forgot to water, your plants died. Tree diaper uh, is a device that will prevent that. Absolutely. Tree Diaper is a revolutionary watering system that slowly releases water over the around the base of your plants or trees as the soil dries. This happens over three weeks. Um, they f- it fills with water when you when it waters or it rains. No more watering or underwatering, overwatering, underwatering with the tree diaper. Every time it rains, tree diaper recharges. No pipes, hoses, or electricity needed. You can water your plants and trees whether you're down the ho- by your house, down the road, back forty, etc. Works under mulch. Whether you're a first-time gardener or advanced, Tree Diaper will improve the way you water your plants. You can go to TreeDiaper.com. They have multiple sizes and uh, solutions, so that's TreeDiaper.com. Well, um, as we're uh, getting into the end of gardening season, uh, we can kind of expand the topics of conversation on the program here, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about self-care DIY organic methods like natural yeah like stuff you have in your kitchen type of thing not something Um, you pick a bottle up and you got to sit down because it's a novel of all the things that was involved in order making there's nothing wrong with that you know people have but there's some people it it, it's very concerning whenever they pick something up and there's 75 ingredients when it should be like four right or you know this is good for a rainy or snowy day and you're like oh i just got dumped on with snow i don't want to go anywhere but I'm going to make myself... I've got this uh, stuff. i got some stuff, right? So um, I think one of my favorite DIY uh, things you can do is make a little face mask. And you can find all sorts of uh, recipes online. But Th- a lot This of, is for the, for like the skin. Face. Yeah, 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 skin yeah. on your face. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Not for Halloween. Not for Halloween. I mean, it could be. Husbands, don't, do, don't use that joke. <laughs> it, it's, it's only funny if there's a lot of people in the room. And, anyway. they're, and they're on your side. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. So anyway, 
Um, you know, there's all sorts of recipes from yogurt, pumpkin, pumpkin puree, and uh-huh. you might have some of that at this time of year. Um, bananas, honey. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I've seen. I wouldn't yeah, say it, like avocado. Isn't that something? Oh yeah, avocado. They, they put on, yeah. Yeah. And cucumbers are good for around the eyes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cucumbers are anti-inflammatory. Uh-huh. Absolutely. You know some things, Joey. I know some stuff about a few things. Yeah, mm-hmm. sometimes. Um, another one is uh, bath salts. So a lot, you take Epsom salt and then you mix in some um, essential oils and you make yourself some nice little bath salts to soak in. Or you can do it for your feet, what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, sugar scrub. Now, if you what, what what is a sh- what is a when, is like in, an, whenever you see these things for people who are, may not understand all of it, when you see a skin scrub or or that type of thing, what is the purpose of using that on yourself? So, skin scrub is to exfoliate, which means that you're basically like sloughing off the dead skin. Okay. So, which naturally would come off anyway, right? Yeah. Yes and no. Okay. Um, sometimes you know you might be feel a little. Flaky, especially in winter. Okay. So you use like the, like what what some people may define as ashy. Ashy. Yeah. 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 Okay. Around yeah. like elbows or knees, you'll see that more right. prevalent there. Absolutely. And so it's fun to to have these scrubs, and then you scrub yourself off. I would highly recommend if you are using a sugar scrub, just make sure you avoid um, places that in your body that create more heat, like mm-hmm. your underarms. If you have uh, excess weight where skin rubs skin against, folds, yeah. yeah, that type of thing. Things like that. So just keep it maybe like on your legs, arms, elbows. Well, would you say experiment in an area that's not, you know, make sure it's going to not cause irritation? Or, well, yeah, yeah, if you yeah, have no. sensitive skin, you may want to be aware of that. But what I'm saying is that even if you don't, when you're using these products, make sure you rinse thoroughly because mm-hmm. you don't want to have that sugar. That residue left. Left over on your skin. And and, and, and well, as we talk through these things, and there's probably somebody in the combine listening to this going, I'm not going to do this. Uh, is, this is a girl topic. This is a woman topic. But it's not really. No, it's not. It's just like happy self-care. I have ex- I gave you an exfoliation once. Yeah. Right? You, it was that on the feet? Wasn't that what that was? It's like your feet and your yeah. legs. Yeah. Yeah. We did some... I think we were snowed in and we did some pedicures or something. Well, I, I didn't ever get, no, I didn't get no pedicures, <laughs> but you did I rub did the, exfoliation. the exfoliation, right? Yeah. yeah. You soaked your feet. Yes. That's part of a pedicure. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now you're the guy in the combine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then also there's things like a lot of people will put coconut oil on their skin. Mm-hmm. That is something that some people do have issues of it clogging pores. Right. It is it is a possibility. So and some something. of you may be allergic to coconut and don't even know it. So you want to be aware of that. It's also good for oral uh, care. There, there's some yeah, benefits well, to like using. Oral pulling. R- well, yeah. Not necessarily removing cavities, but giving your mouth a, a healthier thing, ha- being healthier in your right, mouth. Yeah. Right. Um, good thing to know. The good thing to remember is that because coconut oil becomes more solid above room temperature, mm-hmm. you want to keep that in mind. Don't dispose of it down your drain right yeah and it'll last pretty much forever it will go bad but it's got quite a shelf life on it um apple cider vinegar as a hair rinse what what are we talking about a lot of people will do this after they wash their hair um they use it as like a hair rinse like almost like a cream rinse or so not like a condi- oh, like like a conditioner, a conditioner okay yeah. i've never done this because i have very thick hair right you got a um, mop up there. Yeah, and I. What what uh, what is this supposed to? What it's is supposed to like help kind of clarify it and bring shine? Because the, the apple cider vinegar it has a, a a very low pH. Right. Does that have any effect to any of this stuff or something about the shine? Okay. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing. No, you would not apply full apple cider vinegar. You would water it down. A little Dilute bit. it. Yeah, definitely. Um, make your own tea. So maybe. You know, you have some herbs laying around, or you grew herbs, you dried them, you can enhance your tea. Maybe you have some mint, and you are going to enjoy a cup of tea, and you add the mint leaves to it. Well, the, the it's time for a cup of tea. Uh, tea is a very, and we've got people that listen, and we're not making fun of you, those of you listening in the UK. Tea is, it's God, country, and tea, and then right. family. I right. mean, that's kind of the, the order that it goes in. Yeah, the country, like, shuts down for tea every day. Right. And... and it bring it's something that unites the country to some level, I guess. Um, the, the Americans, uh, we we haven't caught on to that uh, quite as tradition. I guess it's traditional and and historic and gives time to. Ref- I don't know, understand all of it, but it's pretty cool that like everybody drinks tea over there, no matter what temperature it is. 
Absolutely. Um, and then dyeing your hair with coffee. Which you have done. I have done. And there's also alternative methods to dye your hair besides coffee, but this is the one beet, I can- Beet juice. Beet juice, yeah. This is one I can speak about. And so basically, I use the coffee grounds- and I used the coffee itself, and I put the... And this was not... This wasn't... This, you specifically brewed this coffee for the hot hair dye application. Right. Yeah. I mean, I didn't put the hot coffee on my head. No, but you had to brew it and, you yeah. had to, and let it cool, and then yeah. you use that as the dye mechanism right. tool. Basically, you brew very, very strong coffee, mm-hmm. so you don't, you don't you know, water down too much. And then you take the coffee grounds and you mix them in with the leave-in conditioner and then you put this coffee then you apply the liquid part of the coffee and then you put your hair in a plastic bag mm-hmm. and you let it sit and soak and then your hair if your hair is porous my hair is very porous so it did absorb a lot of that brown color it was a temporary dye. It right. did eventually wash out. It, you but, don't go into this expecting like the stuff you buy at the store where it's instantly no. shades different. Boom. Totally from light to almost black. Right. No. V- very subtle. It is very subtle. I had had some blonde highlights. This darkened them a bit. It wasn't life changing or altering, but it was cool. It was uh-huh. cool to try it. And also putting leaving that leave-in conditioner in my hair while it was dying in the process, really softened it. Okay. So that's another thing is that it really um, was almost like a hair treatment. All right. Now, if you have maybe thinner hair, not so porous hair. Would something um, like that work for people who are graying, or is it more somebody that's already got a good density of pigmentation already in their hair that's similar to the color of the coffee? I mean, I think that because the gray hair is more coarse, it's probably more porous and it it probably would absorb. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was fun. I thought it was cool. Um, It's a whole process. You definitely have to keep in mind that you have, you are rinsing the coffee essentially. When when you're doing this, don't expect to go to work at seven o'clock that night. Take the whole evening to do such a a project. Yeah. You want to give yourself some time, especially because the longer you leave it on, the more it's spo- supposed to absorb. Mm-hmm. Just like a lot of temporary hair dye, you longer leave it on, the more it's supposed to absorb. So that's another one. Um, I think definitely if you have the time and the patience to make soap, yes. that's another one. And um, You got to get like, lye, which is sometimes difficult to obtain. Yeah, I think there is like other ways to make mm-hmm. good process soaps, though. But, and, and we don't have a, a soap sponsor, but... I, I've been, uh, what would you say, 10 years using homemade soap, essentially. Yeah. Totally different from and, and from store-bought. Night and day. Um, what do you like about it? You use this. It's very soft. It's got a fragrance to it. It doesn't have a chemical residue that feels like it's left uh, on your skin. The natural soap cleanses, cleans, and then washes away, and it doesn't feel like there's a film left on your skin. If you're still using commercial-grade, store-bought soap from the big companies, take $5, go buy you a bar of soap, and just see how much of a difference it makes. It is worth the extra dollars. Do you think it lasts longer? I think it's about the same. Okay. Now, I will say, if you leave it in the shower, if you put a commercial bar and, and a, I call it homemade soap, but uh, natural soap, and you leave it on the shelf, the natural soap is going to dissolve much quicker than the commercial soap. What we're talking about is the natural soap is when, like, we I get it from the organic food co-op or sometimes online. It's specifically but... made with much safer yeah. ingredients than the big companies that you buy at the big Big grocery stores or convenience stores, that type of thing. And sometimes you can smell like a tree. Right. Yeah. And, and lavender and sawdust. Sand, sand, or, yeah. Sand, uh, yeah. Cedar. Very, yeah. very good. Uh, yeah. Sometimes. Well, Holly, summer's over. We've experienced this. We know this. Snow's coming in some places. Kids are in school. Nights are getting cold. But hey, there's still time to get that lawn figured out and fixed before it goes to bed for the winter. Just because it's fall, we don't want to forget about our lawns. Um, You know, those Japanese beetles, they've been around. They may be gone, but they're not far away. They feasted on your roses and berries this summer. They laid eggs in your turf. You can take a stand with Grub Gone from Phylum. It's a non-chemical BT granular that specifically targets scared pests and their larvae. You simply apply the granule with a spreader, irrigate into the soil, and let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. Not only is Grub Gone easy to use, because Holly just explained how easy it was, it's the only non-chemical choice that effectively controls grubs. And the best part, it's non-toxic to pollinators, the beneficial ones, such as bees, butterflies, and other pollinating insects. 
uh, Grub Gone has zero restrict label restrictions, so you don't have to worry about it toxifying anything. Get your Grub Gone. You go to BeetleGone.com. That's BeetleGone.com to get your Grub Gone. And when you are there, you can save 10% on your order by using coupon code GARDENTALK10. At Grub Gone, to get your uh, to get your Grub Gone, you go to Beetle Gone and use coupon code Garden Talk Ten to save ten percent on your order. We go through a lot of coupon codes. We got a lot of companies with coupon codes. You can go to our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable and click on the Money tab at the top of the page, and they're all listed for you. Hang out with us, Bread Maker and author. Hannah Della Cruz will be with us. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. GutterSense is an easy-to-use rain gutter cleaning tool made of angled tongs that help you safely clean your gutters from the ground. No more ladders needed. Stay safe on the ground. Visit GutterSense.com. Do you have nuts or fruit in your yard? A nut wizard is a handy, effective tool that will pick up round or oval tree produce quickly and easily, leaving debris behind for a clean harvest. A nut wizard tool saves your back and your time. Visit NutWizard.com for more information. This week's garden tip is sponsored by the amazing Dr. Zymes. Eliminate and prevent garden pests with their 100% all-natural, all-in-one insecticide and fungicide. Experience powerful natural protection from insects, fungus, mold, and mildew. Try a free sample. Visit drzymes.com forward slash garden talk. Preventative measures before planting, before you amend your soil for the season, Apply one cup of Eliminator to five gallons of warm water and spray over the planting area and then add more water after you apply so that the product can penetrate the soil. This will ensure that you rid your soil of insect eggs, larvae, molds, and mildews and start the season off right. Dr. Zymes is OMRI listed, safe up to the time of harvest, and doesn't leave a residue. That helpful garden tip was sponsored by the amazing Dr. Zymes. Eliminate and prevent garden pests with their 100% all-natural, all-in-one insecticide and fungicide. Experience powerful natural protection from insects, fungus, mold, and mildew. Try a free sample. Visit drzymes.com forward slash garden talk. Hey gardeners, it's that time of growing season, so let's start canning. Head over to Fleet Farm for all of your canning supplies and jam mixes. In one easy stop, find everything you need, like jars, lids, canners, strainers, racks, spatulas, and funnels from top brands like Ball and Kerr. Plus, pick up mixes, sugar, and more. When it comes to canning, get everything you need at your canning headquarters, Fleet Farm. With the right tools, plant maintenance is easy and more effective. Ironwood Tool Company has the right tools for your project. From pruners to loppers to saws and shears and cleanup tools, get the right tool for this season, making your job much easier. Find them all at ironwoodtools.com. Are you bugged by bugs? You need naturally green products, no more bugs. Environmentally friendly, made in the USA. No More Bugs is a cedar blend that repels and eliminates mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, roaches, and ants, and more. No Bugs is safe for you, your pets, and plants. Visit natgreenproducts.com. You can enter promo code GREENTHUMB10 for 10% off your purchase of any size of No More Bugs. Protect your plants from damage with the 3-in-1 Plant Guard and Special Blend Fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Use promo code RADIO10 to save 10% off your order. Thanks for listening to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. As you've heard through the program, many companies offering coupon codes to help you save on great products. If you've missed any of those coupon codes, you can go to our parent website, the thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, and click on the Money tab at the top of the page, and they're all listed for you. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Rootmaker, Dripworks, Pomona Universal Pectin, Phylum Bioproducts, Tree Diaper, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Deer Defeat, Water Hoop. Find all sponsors at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Moments away, Hannah Della Cruz going to be talking about baking and sourdough bread. So don't miss that. Hang out with us. But first, a message from our good friends from Simple Grow at Simple Grow. 
Are you worried about your plant growth? Provide your plants with what they need to grow to their potential. Simple, Simple Grow offers 100% organic worm castings at simplegrow.com. Unlike other worm casting products, when you order from Simple Grow, you are getting 100% worm castings, not filler plus castings. For more ideal soil structure and aeration with Simple Grow all natural odor free worm castings, there's only one ingredient worm castings. No chemicals or additives will seep into your food. It doesn't smell like other fertilizers. For indoor and outdoor use, you can order by the bag, bundle, ton, or truckload. Check out Simple Grow 100% worm castings can do for your plants. And order today at simplegrow.com. Holly, let's go to the proclamation hotline brought to you by Proclamation. Goods and bring in our guests for this week. Hannah Dela Cruz is the creator and voice of Make It Dough. She is passionate about baking and sourdough. She loves sharing her passion with others and helping people learn how to make better bread. She is the author of Sourdough Every Day. Welcome to the program, Hannah. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Well, we thank you for coming on the program and what the information you're about to educate Holly and myself and all of our listeners with. And I'll I'll start with this before we get into the whole sourdough bread and all of that in your book. Where were you always a baker or was this something you caught on later in life? I've been baking um, basically forever. I've always been passionate about it, but sourdough and bread making kind of came a little bit later. Um, I, around 2018 is when I actually baked my first, um, ever bread. I baked some rolls and then after that I kind of got into the sourdough thing. Well, many people may, people, many people know of sourdough bread, but what Mm -hmm. is it exactly? What are, what else can you make with it besides just bread? Yeah, so sourdough is basically a fermented mixture of flour and water. So if you mix flour and water together and you kind of leave it for a, you know, a certain number of days, usually um, seven to ten days, then it kind of gets cultivated into this mixture that allows you to um, make bread with it. Um, it develops you know, a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. And those microorganisms produce lactic acid bacteria and acetic acid bacteria and carbon dioxide that makes, you know, the flavor and the consistency of sourdough bread, which we all love. Um, Yeah. uh, So are are we putting this in in a bowl with a towel over it? And is there a specific type of flour that should be used rather than just the cheap stuff you buy at the grocery store? Yeah. So um, you can use any type of flour. You can use all purpose, whole wheat, rye um, or bread flour. I personally like to use unbleached organic all purpose flour just because bleaching um, tends to kill off a lot of the um, beneficial microorganisms that you want to cultivate in your starter. So most of the bacteria and yeast that are going to live in your starter are going to really mimic the uh, makeup of your flower. So that's where mostly you're getting your microorganisms from. So you want to start with a really good quality flower. Um, I prefer to do all purpose because it tends to be a little bit less expensive than bread flour or whole wheat or any other specialty flours. Um, but you can use those flours as well if you like to um, cultivate a whole wheat starter. But most recipes that you'll find online and my recipes call for a all 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 white starter. So I just find that it's a little bit more, you know, um, flexible and a little bit more adaptable to a lot of recipes that you'll find out there. Now, when people are making bread or whatnot with this, this is the this is the part that does the the rising right like because mm-hmm. you're not you're not adding a yeast this is the part that is responsible yes. for the yeah like the rising the um I the, the lift the lift yeah right yes yes okay uh-huh um, yeah so instead of using commercial yeast you'll be using your sourdough starter okay fantastic so you um you wrote this book sourdough every day mm-hmm. What can our listeners expect when they pick up a copy? Maybe there's something unique or interesting that will perk their interest. Yeah, so I actually, so I was inspired to write my book Sourdough Every Day because I had created so many sourdough discard recipes. 
So in the process of making your sourdough starter, in the process of creating your starter itself and um, kind of taking care of it once you have it, you'll go through a process that's called feeding. So what feeding means is that you get rid of a lot of your starter and you just keep a little bit of it and you add more flour and water to it. And you do that because starter is, like I said, it's a community of bacteria and yeast, and those things are alive. Just like us, they need they need to eat. You know, they're born, they eat, they re- re- they reproduce, and then after that, they die. Um, so, so feeding. So, since those microorganisms are alive, you kind of have to keep giving them nutrients to survive. Um, but if you didn't get rid of any of your starter, you'll just end up with so much that you're not going to be able to feed it enough um, flour and water. So you end up kind of with a lot of discard. And I started ending up with so much discard. And I started researching what I could do with that discard. And I started finding recipes for cookies and cakes. So that inspired me to create some recipes of my own. Because when I first um, started my sourdough journey, there weren't really a lot of discard recipes out there that were super creative. A lot of them were just waffles and pancakes. So those were the recipes that I kept finding. And then I kind of realized that, you know, starter is just flour and water. So if you can incorporate that in a recipe, you can end up with a lot of the benefits of sourdough, which is, you know, flavor, taste, moisture, and sometimes even fermentation. So a lot of the recipes in my book are actually sourdough discard recipes. So there's, you know, there's some cake recipes in there. There's cookie recipes. There's, of course, the breakfast recipes that we all love. And then there's also bread recipes and um, even pies and pastry. Well, why would some why would you encourage people to to make sourdough? Now, I'm I'm going to take I'm not a, a, a doctor or anything, but I'm going to take the guess that because the culture of the sourdough that probably has good beneficial gut health capabilities. Am I close on any of that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So basically, starter. Um, a lot of experts say that starter is um, healthier because. The organisms actually digest the flour um, before you eat it. So um, there's a lot of nutrients in wheat that we can't absorb into our bodies because we don't have the enzymes to do it. So cows can eat wheat or grain um, and absorb all the nutrients nutrients from them because they have enzymes in their bodies that allow them to do that. And as human beings, we don't really have those enzymes. So that's why, um, you know, there's there was a lot of fads about bread being really unhealthy. And that's because, you know, like we can't really uptake those nutrients in our bodies the same way that those animals can. And when you're fermenting your dough, um, those organisms are actually digesting, pre-digesting that flour for you so that those nutrients that are in wheat that we can normally not unlock um, get, get unlocked and we can actually, um, absorb them in our bodies. So it's a little bit more healthy for, for you than normal bread made with commercial yeast. Well, and and it seems to be the process for people who enjoy this type of thing. It's a little more interesting, fun. And if you do it, as you've described, you will always have that starter and you will always have that continuation if you can keep up with it. And it's not just, it's not just bread. You can, make a vast variety of things and in turn be you know healthier eating than just that traditional bread that we buy at the store that we really don't know what the heck is in it. Yeah, exactly. It's such a fun hobby when you get kind of invested in it. Um, you learn so much about, I personally have learned so much about um, microorganisms, the invisible world of bacteria and yeast and everything that's going on all around us that we can't really see. And um, yeah, and it's it's actually such a adaptable and flexible hobby. So a lot of people get kind of worried that like if they go on vacation, what are they going to do with their starter? You can actually keep your starter in the fridge and it'll survive even for like a month without being able to feed it. But you don't want your starter to get too weak because it could grow mold 
So um, as long as you kind of keep on top of it, kind of feed it every now and then, it's a lot more flexible and adaptable than people think. And you don't really need all this um, kind of time invested. In, but you do need a little bit of time investment into it, but not you don't need to babysit your starter as much as people think. And you just keep this on the counter. If you're not going to be traveling or going away, you can kind of keep it on the counter mm -hmm. in a bowl. Is that okay? Yes, exactly. Okay. So you can keep it. You can, you can, um, you know, spend as much time on it as you as you want based on your schedule. Hmm. That's fantastic. So we're talking with um, Hannah Dela Cruz. She is an author of Sourdough Every Day, a passionate bread maker and likes to teach other about it. So what are some common challenges with the sourdough? I know, as you mentioned, the the uh, discard dough and then also mm -hmm. just, you know, keeping it fed. What are there some challenges that people may face and want to keep in mind if they if they do start to make their own sourdough? Yeah, so I think the um, main challenge with sourdough is that you have to have a lot of patience, especially when you're in that first process of creating your sourdough starter. So I think that's when a lot of people give up because they'll start making their starter. And then there's a period of time um, in the middle of creating your starter, in that two-week period where your starter just won't show any activity. And that's because your, cult your culture, that world of yeast that you're trying to cultivate is um, kind of still battling for dominance. So you're the yeast, the beneficial yeast and the microorganisms that you want in your starter are kind of still trying to, you know, rule your culture. And um, while it's trying to find that balance, you might not see any activity at all. But if you just continue feeding it and kind of continue feeding it on a normal schedule, then um, it'll survive and then you'll see that it'll start getting bubbly and, um, you know, be able to make your bread rise but it takes a little while to get to that point so i think a lot of people give up during that period um and then there's also challenges of you know mastering bread making bread making can be quite difficult um it's not a skill that we're actually born with we're not you know it's something that you kind of have to work at until you get like the result that you want you know you get the open crumb that a lot of people want um that because they see pictures of it online a lot of mastery kind of goes into that. So um, those are some of the challenges that kind of make want, want people to give up. But that's the fun part about bread making, I think, is that, you know, you're going to always be learning something new. And with every bake, you're going to improve. And um, it never gets boring. Well, Hannah, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered us. How? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Holly's got a follow up here, I think. Um, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sourdough is pretty easy to start with, right? Like to make, you just kind of need a, mm -hmm. a home for it, some flour, water. And then yes. at some point when you do add it to a recipe, is it something maybe you need like a food scale for? Or, you know, if somebody were to want to do this and they're like, mm -hmm. I don't know how much of a commitment dollar wise I want to put in this. What, okay. would you, what would you say? Yeah. So actually, you know, you can actually make sourdough with a lot of um, stuff that you already have at home, you know, you first of all need a jar or, um, to keep your starter in. You need some mixing bowls. I think people have, have that. I like to mix my dough by hand. Um, so there's actually not a lot of special equipment necessary. Um, you do have to have a Dutch oven. I think that's the easiest way to bake bread because you do need to bake with a little bit of steam. And then, as you mentioned, um, a tool that a lot of people probably don't already have that they would need to invest in to be a serious bread maker is a scale because um, it's a little bit more accurate with measurement than volume. But a scale is super cheap. You can get a scale um, online for, you know, maybe $10. I, th I still have my $10 scale from uh, four years ago that I, you know, it's it's still there. I'm still using it, still works. So um there's not a lot of investment uh, money wise to start this hobby. Maybe you do, you're going to use a lot more flour than you're used to. So, and you know, flour prices are a little bit more expensive than it, than it used to be, but it's still not that bad. I mean, a bag of really good flour maybe is five to $7 and that's really, you know, the it, big investment that you have to, it's beneficial though. Yeah. It's it, beneficial. It, there's a purpose behind that investment. Yes. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you keep your starter, if you 
you know, if you keep it fed, if you keep it well maintained, if it's vigorous, healthy, and um, dependable, then, um, you know, it could even outlive you. I've heard of that. <laughs> that's, well, that's, yes. That's, yeah. <laughs> well, we, <laughs> we really appreciate having you on the show. How can people find out more about you and your book and your great info? Yeah, sure. So um, my people can find my recipes and um, all my musings on my website, makeitdough.com. And I'm always on Instagram at makeitdough. Um, I usually post on there every day. Some of my, you, get, you can get updated and on my new recipes and everything else that's going on with Make It Dough on my Instagram. Well, Hannah, we greatly appreciate the time and the education class that you've given Holly and myself and all of our listeners about how easy it is to make sourdough bread because probably many yes. of us thought this is something I don't want to do because it seems mm-hmm. very difficult. We thank you for all of that. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me on your program. Absolutely. And when we come back, it's your garden questions, our garden answers. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Jung Seed Company is a family-owned and operated gardening company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online. Use code 10 TG22 to receive 10% off your order at jungseed.com. That code again is 10TG22. ShipDrop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, ShipDrop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ShipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest from their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you with the harvest that you've never seen before. Visit Rootmaker.com and use coupon code RADIO22 to save 15% off your order. That's Rootmaker.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. When winter hits with heavy snowfall and frigid temperatures, your outdoor furniture takes a beating. What you need to do is cover it with custom protective covers from CoversAndAll.com. They have a bunch of waterproof tear and abrasion resistant fabrics to choose from. And each cover is made with waterproof stitching. Covers and All has a lot of customization options, incredibly easy design and order process to make covering any size or shape a snap. Visit CoversAndAll.com and use code GARDEN25 at checkout to save 25% off your purchase. Thanks for listening to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. As you've heard through the program, many companies offering coupon codes to help you save on great products. If you've missed any of those coupon codes, you can go to our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, and click on the Money tab at the top of the page, and they're all listed for you. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Tree Ripe, Covers in All, Ironwood Tool Company, Timber Pro Coatings, Blue Ribbon Organics, Natural Green Products, Algae Men, Dr. Zyme, Happy Leaf LED, Rescue, Big Tool Rat, Hot Bin Composting, Proclamation Goods. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us today. Time for your garden questions, our garden answers. you got a question, you can certainly send that over to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call on the Proclamation Hotline brought to you by Proclamation Goods. That number is 1-800-927-SHOW. 1-800-927-7469. Proclamation Goods creates cookware for the eco-conscious home chef. Their pans are non-toxic, have a lifetime warranty, and are made in Wisconsin. Their award-winning stainless steel Proclamation Duo cookware set is a 12-inch skillet and a stock pot that doubles as a wok. Best of all, the skillet and stock pot hinge together to form a Dutch oven. It's two pans with a versatility of 10, empowering you to cook more with less. If you care about your health and strive for a more sustainable lifestyle, then Proclamation Goods is for you. Supplies limited to orders now at proclamationgoods.com. All right. This question is uh, sponsored by Fleet Farm and fleetfarm.com. I was wondering why I have no 
nuts this year on one of my black walnut trees on the property, and the other one did quite well. Any advice on what is going on? Well, occasionally walnuts will not produce any fruits during the growing season because of stressors such as drought, pests, and lack of nutrients. Also, I'm assuming probably lack of pollination as well. It depends, yeah, yeah. But just because you think the tree looks good, take a closer look. There's obviously there's additional problems going on because a pest can be at the very top of the canopy and you don't see it and it can have dramatic effect on the production of that tree. Um, uh, the age of the tree has, you know, all of these, there's many factors uh, for that. All right, uh, Holly, you want to read Dustin? Dustin writes in about hostas and his challenge uh, with them. Dusty says, Yeah, I can't, Dusty, sorry, I apologize, Dusty. Yeah. I can't get rid of hostas that's been here by the previous homeowner. They are almost as bad as crabgrass. I dug them out, but you, if you miss any roots, they keep coming back. They're so aggressive. I don't use herbicides. So I don't know what to do. They're creeping into the grass. For this reason, I really don't care for hostas. <laughs> this one gets purple flowers and narrow dark leaves. I was given a lime green one um, and called, I'm concerned about, you know, all of it. I don't, I really don't like hostas. They're not attractive. Um, basically, any ideas how to get rid of them? Yeah, they spread like crabgrass. They're spreading like crabgrass. Okay, so couple of things here. Obviously, you don't want to use a glyphosate. You've made that clear. Um, there are organic means like uh, Nat Green products, uh, no more weeds. Uh, it's a, a vinegar, horticultural grade vinegar that will continue to continue to burn back the, the plant and it will die. Eventually, you can use uh, Green Thumb 10 to save 10% off your purchase. Uh, uh, you know, that's more anymore. But yeah, uh, use coupon code weeds and buy three one gallons and get the uh, fourth gallon free. Um, you can also use black plastic. You, as they come up, you continue to cut them back, and eventually you're going to stress the plant out so much that it uses up the energy in the tuber, and it's going to do that. The other challenge that you have is in the spring, as they're coming up, continue to dig them out. Dig them out. There's going to be a lot of tubers in the ground, so this is going to be a very lengthy process. Um, oftentimes, people will advise using a glyphosate that will suck it right down to the tubers, kill the whole plant away, and then that's it. But other people have a different thought process on the damage in which glyphosate or that uh, that weed killer can do for your property. So the consistency, this may take two, three, four years in order to get this done. But being on top of it, digging them out as they come up, chopping them off as they come up, uh, put covering them up with black plastic and kind of solarizing the ground and killing them that way will also potentially do what it needs to do. Uh, that's the best we can do. Absolutely. Um, so another question is, is, my leeks are not very tall or thick. Can I let them overwinter and harvest in the spring? Yes. Yes, you can. But here's the uh, caveat. You want to either, if you've got problems with rabbits or deer, you won't have leeks in the spring. They will have mowed them down to the ground. Uh, if they are thin and Bidly, you are not going to get much of any growth now through early spring if you're able to keep them vertical and nothing eating on them. As the spring soil warms, you're going to get a little bit of girth put on them, but you got to be careful because they are biannuals. They are going to go to seed the second year, which will be next spring. And as soon as they feel that warmth of spring, they're going to put a seed pod and a shoot on, and it's going to be very tough to consume the actual leak portion because it's going to transition into a reproductive state rather than a tender state like you currently have. So there's a very um, difficult or challenging balance that you have to juggle there because you may let them grow in the spring and harvest them, and then there's this solid core like like inside of a pineapple tough uh, stem that you're not going to be able to consume no matter what you do in regards to that. So uh, the biggest challenge we have is uh, animals consuming it. Um, so if you can keep that, but, um, you know, giving you the advice that, that the, 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 an the right answer, and you can choose how you want to explore that right answer. Um, so I would like to pickle peppers that I have harvested, Holly. Uh, they are green. I like to pickle them with when they change colors when I leave them on the counter for two to four weeks. Uh, most of them will change a, a red 
yellow, or orange. However, I do know that when you can, you want to can the freshest produce you can. Is this safe to do to let them set for several weeks to ripen before pickling them? Holly. Um, yeah, you can you can let them ripen. That's fine. But as they ripen, they're going to kind of shrivel because they're not on the... You, typically, you would let them ripen on yeah. the vine. We're setting so, them in the kitchen for two to four weeks. The, 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 the rule is freshest, best for canning. Right. So, yeah, with that being said, you you want to watch them. If they're, if they're starting to get shrivelly looking, that's not good. So they might not ripen, um, and then you would have to find an alternate use for them. Mm-hmm. Or some people take those green peppers. Creamy pepper up. soup. You can make some soup. Sometimes they'll just take them, chop them up, put them in the freezer, and then add them. You, you don't even have to, like, parboil them. You can just take them out of the freezer and add them to... You know, your mirepoix when you're cooking stuff, um, yeah. stuff like that. So um, you may not be able to pickle them this year, but you can definitely put them in the freezer and uh, use them for your sautés and, you know, uh, soups or whatever. Well, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of the program today would like to revisit it? You can do that by going to our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, clicking on the Radio 6 tab at the top of the page and catch up on all past shows. Uh, or you can send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We are wrapping up the season. Next week is our final show of season six. We're going to talk about our favorite dishes from the garden and then what Holly and I do outside of being in the garden, some of our hobbies and uh, some of the things that we enjoy since we have a little time to conversate with you uh, at the end of the season. We have hobbies outside of the garden. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, I'll tell you yours uh, next week. (laughs) No, it's not... (laughs) It, somebody's going to take it the wrong way. I know. And our guest will be author Ryan McEndry, and we will answer. Uh, we'll, well, we won't answer any questions because we'll give some thank yous out. So until next week, for Holly, Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs> <laughs>